Amen. So in Leviticus 14, we have this, you know, these, these different uh, methods of going about of, you know, diagnosing and treating these different plagues that are in here, this leprosy that's in there, both in the leper and himself and in garments and in uh, houses. But I want to just focus in there specifically on how the uh, leper was to be treated. If you look there in verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper. And the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought unto the priest. And then, you know, you have verse 10. It picks up there, and he gives all these different, uh, he's on the eighth day, he's going to take two lambs, one ewe lamb, and on this flower and the, with mingled oil, a log of oil. And the priest is going to present him. And if you look at verse uh, 13, And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And if you were able to be here this morning, you know, that would sound very familiar to you. You know, we just read about that this morning in Leviticus chapter 8, that when Moses was to sanctify Aaron and his sons into the priesthood, that he did the exact same thing with the blood of, of the ram, that he, would, he put it upon the tip of the right ear, on the right thumb, and the right great toe. So here again, you have this same procedure being done, except this time, it's the priest himself who's been sanctified into that priesthood that is now in turn applying that blood upon a leper, okay? And of course, leprosy in the Bible is a picture of sin. You know, it's a disease that spreads. It's something that we should separate from. And it's something that here, when, when we're cleansed of it, there's this picture of the blood being a part of that cleansing, okay? And we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. And there's a lot of passages about that. If you would, keep something Leviticus 14. We'll come back later. Go to 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3. And we talked a lot about that this morning, how the, the blood is what cleanses us from sin. We all understand that. And there's a lot of different pa passages we could turn to, but for sake of time, we'll move along here. And for one example would be Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians chapter 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. First Peter talks about how we have been uh, redeemed from our vain conversation, excuse, from uh, the received by our tradition from our fathers, but with the precious uh, blood of a Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And there's many other passages, okay? So again, you have this picture of the leper coming to a priest and receiving the blood applied to him in order to signify that he has been made clean, okay? And I want to just draw a few parallels here uh, this evening and, and make some application. But the first thing I want to point out is that the leper could not apply the blood himself. The leper could not go and apply that blood himself. Somebody else, a priest, had to do it. And again, we talked about this morning how through the blood of Christ, we are made priests unto our God, that we have been made a holy priesthood, okay? And now we have this picture of the priest who's, who also has been uh, sanctified and put into the priesthood, now himself applying the blood, okay? And the application is this, is that, you know, the, 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 it is ne the, the necessity of the soul winner, the necessity of the soul winner. Look, people aren't going to get saved by themselves. Somebody has to come along, a priest like you and I, you know, that's what we are, the priesthood of believer has to come, come along and apply that blood and show them, look, this is how you to be saved and open up the word of God and preach them Christ. And by faith, the blood of Christ is then applied to them. The necessity of the soul winner. And this is something that we need to understand and, and never lose sight of. And never think that, you know, it doesn't matter if I don't go soul winning. Or it doesn't matter if our, you know, if our church doesn't go soul winning. Look, soul winning is the most important thing that we do as a church. It's the most important thing. Because it's absolutely necessary. Because the, the Levite, or excuse me, the leper, he couldn't just go get these sacrifices, kill himself wherever he feels like, and apply the blood and pronounce himself clean. He had to go before the priest. He had to go through this. Uh, ceremony, he had to go through this sacrifice, and it was somebody else that had to take that blood and dip it in his, fi his finger in that blood and apply it to him and pronounce him clean. And look, it's the same thing that we have to do. We have to go out there and take and preach the blood of Christ and apply it to people. Now, obviously, it's not a perfect picture, okay? You know, the leper always, of course, any leper is going to want to be cleansed, all right? They're going to want to receive that blood you know, a lot of times we're going to go out and preach and people are just going to come to the door like they did this afternoon and take one look at me and go, oh, and just close the door, right? But then you're going to have other people who are going to get saved and tear down all the idols off their wall, literally, right? 
So again, it's not a perfect picture, but the application is this, is that, look, we as priests, it's our job, it's our duty to go out and apply the blood to the lepers. The leper cannot do it himself. And a lot of people get this idea that, you know, that the soul winner is somehow just kind of optional. You know, it's, they'll even say, oh, it's ideal. Yeah, ideally you would have somebody preach the gospel to someone, but they can get saved in all these different ways. But, and yet, we're going to look at several different examples here in the scripture where that is not the case. You know, where we can't just get, people can't just get saved by reading a Bible track. People can't just get saved by, you know, uh, just, just having, you know, reading it somewhere. This, there has to be someone that actually preaches the gospel to them and plants that seed and waters that seed. Because that's the example and, and throughout the entire New Testament. Every salvation that you look at, it's just somebody else preaching, somebody else preaching, someone bringing the gospel. It's this picture all the way back in Leviticus of the priest has to be the one to apply the blood to the leper. He has to one that the, be the, uh, you know, the intermediary there. He has to be the one that kind of conducts that service to guide that you know, leper through that ritual. And make that application. The, necess- the necessity of the soul winner. I mean, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where you are, verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, or, Apollos excuse me, but ministers by whom ye believed? He's saying, look, we are the ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now, does it say there that he gave them to most men? Or does it say every man? It says every man. It says that God gave to every man a minister by whom they believed. The necessity of the soul winner is is the scriptural position. There has to be somebody there to preach the gospel to another person in in order for them to get saved. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, we know this verse, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. You know, he that goes out with the gospel, opens up the word of God, preaches the word of God, he's the wise one. Not the one who just, you know, leaves Bible tracts in every public restroom. And look, this is something that I'm, you know, I, I, I get a little worked up about because, you know, I used to be that way. You know, I just, you know, I wouldn't actually preach to my coworkers. I would just leave the gospel. I'd just leave the chick track with its false, you know, repenting your sin salvation in, you know, the, in, the, in the bathroom. And then, and then I'm thinking, and they keep disappearing, so I'm thinking, oh, they're reading them. And then one day my boss just sits me down and lays it all out in front of me and says, knock it off, right? Or I'll, I would go into the bookstores and libraries, and this is how I would preach the gospel, you know, hide these, these tracks and random books. Someone's going to find this one day. I mean, I remember I worked for somebody. I thought, hey, let's put, a, let's put a gospel. He was a roofer. Let's put a gospel track under one of these shingles that maybe one day someone will find it and read it and get saved. You know, it's a real romantic idea it's real novel, but you know what? It's not the Bible. The Bible says that God gave every man a minister by whom he believed. He didn't give every man a gospel track. He gave every man a minister. For 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did what? Beseech you by us. Who does God beseech the lost by? By us. By the soul winner. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In Ezekiel, the Bible says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap for me, uh, uh, in the gap before the land, before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. What was he looking for? What to stand in that gap? Was he looking for, you know, a creation seminar presentation? Was he looking for a gospel track? No, he was looking for a man. He was looking for a soul winner. He was looking for a preacher to stand in that gap and make up the hedge. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. You know, we'll, 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 most people probably know this here. You know, this is the story of, you know, the, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip there. He's, he's sent down uh, to, uh, from, to, to go down from Jerusalem to, unto Gaza. And he goes and he beholds a man of Ethiopia who's coming back um, from, he's coming back from Jerusalem. It says there in the end of verse 27, for he had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So you literally have a guy. I mean, talk about low-hanging fruit you got this Ethiopian eunuch who's come from all the way from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. I mean, he's just, he wants to know how to be saved, right? And not only that, it's, he, he, he says he was returning, and of course we know the story, the Spirit, verse 30, 29, said unto Philip, go near, join thyself this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. 
So he's coming back from Jerusalem where he just got done worshiping God and he's got the word of God open in front of him. It's not even just a, a cheap little gospel tract. He has the, the prophet Isaiah. You know, Isaiah, he's turned there. And he, and he read, and, 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 and Philip runs up to him and asks him this question, understand what thou readest. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? You know, I'm sure this, this story is just in there because God just, you know, he needed to put some filler in there. You know, he needed to get a certain amount of, uh, of verses in the Bible. So he just said, well, let's just tell that story. No, this story is in here for a reason, folks. And that statement is recorded for a reason. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? Look, there's people in this world that would get saved, that want to get saved, but they can't understand. There's people that we've run into about soul winning. They say, hey, I've been reading the Bible. I don't understand it. I've been a part of this church. They don't have the right gospel. I want to know how to be saved. I can't understand it. That's why we need to go and guide these people. Look, the leper can't apply the blood himself. The priest is the one that has to do it. Necessity of the soul winner. And he desired Philip, it says there in the end of verse 31, that he would come up and sit with him. And then, of course, he, it says there in verse 34, and the, the Enoch, uh, eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet, this of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And see, that's the reason why a lot of people today, a lot of Baptist churches, a lot of evangelical churches want to get away from soul winning because it actually requires you to open your mouth and speak. And you know what that requires? It means you have to know what you're talking about. You actually have to know how to give the gospel. You actually have to go there and maybe even be <gasps> rejected. You might even have to have somebody say, I'm not interested. You might have to have somebody slam a door. They don't like that. They'd rather just send something in the mail. They'd rather just rather, you know, put something up on YouTube. Look, we need to go out into the world and reach these people where they are and open our mouths and make known the mystery of the gospel as we ought to. That's what we've been called to do. <clears throat> go over to Acts chapter 16. Romans chapter 10, you're going to Acts 16. How then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Without a preacher, they're not going to hear. Well, no, 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 they'll, they'll hear through, a, through a, a gospel track. They'll hear through our you know, creation seminar. We'll just debate atheism uh, for, for hours on end, and then eventually they'll hear no, how shall they hear it without a preacher? Somebody has to go and preach them the gospel. In Acts chapter 16, look at verse 30. Of course, this is the famous story about the Philippian jailer, right? We quote this often out soul winning. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I mean, this is, how often do you hear that? Look, and I, I've heard people ask that question. There's been stories I've heard where people literally ask that question. Well, how do I be saved? Right? It's very rare. But here's another just low-hanging fruit. What must I do to be saved? Here, read this. Right here, just take this and go read it on your own and it'll make sense. He said, "How? what must I do to be saved? <clears throat> and, they, and they spake unto him the word of God, is what it says there in verse 32. And they spake. They did what? They opened their mouth. They make, spake unto him the word of God. Yeah, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But then it goes on that they actually went on and got the house together and preached unto them the word of the Lord. They preached the gospel unto all that were in his house. So we see, first of all, with this picture of the leper coming to the priest and being anointed by that blood on, on his right ear and his right thumb and his right uh, toe is the fact that the priest has to be the one that applies the blood. The leper cannot do it himself. He can't just make his own sacrifice and, and apply it to himself and pronounce himself clean. There's the necessity of the priest. You and I today are that priest through Christ. We saw that this morning, that we, through the blood of Christ, have been made priests unto our God. It's our job to help these lepers out, to go out there and find them and say and show them the word of God and to help to apply that blood to their lives. <laughs> now, let me say this. In order to be a soul winner, the only thing you need to be is saved. Look, in order to be a soul winner, the only thing you need to be is saved. You know, and, and sometimes people struggle, and I've heard this many times. People say, I want to preach the gospel, but I just feel like I don't know enough. And look, I went through the same thing. I remember when I first started soul winning, I said, well, I've got to learn how to give the gospel to a Mormon. I've got to learn how to give the gospel to Jehovah Witness. I've got to learn how to give the gospel to a Roman Catholic. I've got to learn how to give the gospel to all these. I thought, I'm just going to have a different way to give gospel 
the gospel to everybody, and I can't do that until I know all of this information. i got to study what they believe, and i got to figure out what the Bible says and know all the talking points. Look, just do away with all that, and just because here's at the end of the day, it's the gospel that saves, not our intellect. It's the gospel that saves, not the power of our speaking. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. What is the power in the gospel? Is it my, is it my uh, intellectual ability? Good thing it's not, because there's not a lot there. <laughs> no, it's the, it's the word of God that does all the heavy lifting for us. Our God, job is just to go out and to preach it. Our job is just to go out and apply that blood. That's all we're to do. And look, all you need to be is saved. Because saved people have the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to get someone saved, the Holy Spirit. If you would, go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Actually, you know what? Just jump down to Acts 10. Acts, cha Acts chapter 10. And look, we have the Holy Spirit, right? If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to get someone saved. And I'm going to develop this here in a minute. But we are sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of our redemption. So I want you to notice this, that in the old, in the, in, throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is represented by oil. Okay, that's a representation of the Holy Spirit. I'll read to you from Luke, Luke 4. You're in Acts 10. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So Jesus said that he had been what? Anointed, okay, which is something that you would do with oil. Okay, the, the, the oil of anointing, right? A lot of times you would see, and that we even read it you know, earlier in Leviticus chapter 14, where he would anoint that leper with oil, right? And Jesus said that he was anointed to what? Preach the gospel, right? And he had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. So again, that what is the anointing that's taking place here? It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And when he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, what did he do? He preached the gospel to the poor. Look, if you have the Holy Spirit you have, and you're saved, well, obviously, if you don't, you're not saved, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have everything it takes to go out and preach the gospel. And newsflash, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. And that's the only thing you need. You need your King James Bible, the Holy Spirit, and that's it, and a willingness to go and a willingness to open your mouth. Even if you have to stutter and stammer and figure your way out on how to give the gospel, you can still get people saved because it's the power of God. It's the scriptures. It's the gospel that get people saved. And the Holy Spirit is represented by oil throughout the scripture. If you would, go back to Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14. The Bible says in 1 John 2, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and it is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So what is this anointing that's going to teach us all things? And what is this anointing that is truth and is no lie? What is this anointing that has taught us and shall abide in us? It's the Holy Ghost. That's why Jesus said in John 14, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall what? Teach you all things. The Holy Ghost is that anointing. The Holy Ghost is represented by that anointing oil. Now I want us to notice, I'm going to make application here with this, going back to Leviticus with the priest. Notice how the priest applied the oil. We already talked about the blood, right? But he also noticed in the story that after he had applied the blood to the leper, he went on and applied the oil, okay? And it says there in verse 15, the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand and the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil in his left hand, and he shall sprinkle it with the oil of his finger seven times before the Lord, and the rest of the oil that is in his hand, the priest shall put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of the right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, and upon the blood of the trespass offering. Okay? So first he, he takes that blood and he anoints him upon the toe, the thumb, and the and, excuse me, the toe, the thumb, and the ear, right? And then he takes the oil that the leper had brought and he puts it into his left hand. Now remember from this morning's sermon, you know, when the, when, when the priest was anointed, he was anointed on his right, right side, right? It was his right ear, right thumb, and right toe. And the left side was left blank, right? There was nothing applied to it. And what is this showing us here? 
is that God uses us in spite of ourselves. Because remember, on the, the application we made this morning was that the, you know, we have two natures as Christians. You know, we're priests unto our God. We've been anointed by the blood of Christ, but we still have that old man, that old nature, that left-hand side that has not been anointed with blood, okay? So which side, which hand is the, is the priest pouring the oil into? He's pouring it into the left hand, okay? And I believe this is a picture of the fact that, he's, he, that God can still use us in spite of our weak flesh, you know, in spite of the old man. I mean, that's how I see it. The left hand, the priest with his anointed blood, the, uh, was not anointed with blood. The right hand was. This represents two natures, right? Working in, conject in conjecture to what? Help heal the lepers. And this is important to understand, okay? Especially these days when you start to hear people get up and want to just berate people about going out soul winning if they're not clean enough. Say, oh, you're, you know, uh, they, we want to be accused of the fact that you know, people want to say things like, oh, you're just using soul winning like some kind of cloak for your sin. You know, I've never taught that. I've never said, hey, it doesn't matter what kind of, you know, life, uh, or, you, you know, you can go ahead and go out and, 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 and uh, win souls and then just live like the devil. I've never taught that. I've never heard anybody else teach that. I've never heard any other pastor or preacher get up and say, oh, you know what, as long as you're soul winning, you can just live as unholy and unclean as you want. Never taught that. And look, if people develop that attitude, that's not my fault. And personally, I don't know anybody like that. I've never heard anybody, and I, I know some people. I know quite a few soul winners. And you know what? Generally speaking, all the ones I know, they actually live pretty decent lives as far as I know. Are they perfect? No. No, they still have the oil in that left hand. They still have it in that side, that the old man. They still have it. They still have their, their faults. They still have their sins. They still have their problems. But at least they're out there trying to, you know, anoint somebody with it. At least they're trying to go out there and spread the oil of gladness out there. At least they're out there trying to help the leper. And why would I want to tear somebody down for that? Why would I say, oh, you're not good enough to go soul winning? All you need is the Holy Ghost. And if you're saved, you got it. <clears throat> when I read this story, when I read about this leper being anointed by the priest and him taking that oil out of his left hand, to me, that just shows us that God uses us in spite of ourselves. Because the fact that, that left hand represents the old man, the old nature. <clears throat> if you would, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. You see, the left hand is what? It's our earthen vessel. That's the title of the sermon this evening. Our earthen vessels. That's what that represents. Of course, we have the right hand that's been anointed. We're priests. I get that, but we still have that old nature to deal with. And we're, never, we're going to have to crucify the flesh every single day. We're going to have to contend with that flesh every single day. So it's silly to sit there and say, well, you know, you can only go soul winning until you've cleaned up, you know, until you've crucified the old man enough. Well, who's, who's going to determine how much, you know, how much sin you have to get out of your life before you can go soul winning? Who's going to make that decision? If anything, you know, we see in the scriptures that as people, sinful people, as they go out soul winning, it actually cleans up their life. They actually want to be, uh, they, they want to live for the Lord even more. They want to be better used. But it says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid for them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Look, I don't go out there and preach my holy life to people. I don't want to say, well, you know, I'm living a holier life. You should listen to me. I go out and I, what do we preach? Christ Jesus the Lord. What does it matter how, how sinful or unsinful my life is? I'm not out there preaching that. I'm out there preaching Christ Jesus. And if anything, if, I'm, if i got a sinful life, all that is is a, is a greater testimony of the fact that Jesus saves. Does it make me a hypocrite? Because <clears throat> I'm not preaching that. I'm not preaching, hey, you know, clean up your life to get saved. I'm preaching, look, God can save the worst sinner. He said, look, we preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God commanded, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at this, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have the treasure of the gospel of Christ in us, but what is it in? It's in a weak, sinful earthen vessel. Where is that oil in the priest? What hand did he put it in? He put it in that left hand. 
that represents that old man. You know what that tells me is that preaching the gospel is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's something that is granted unto us. It's a treasure that's given unto us. It's not something that's earned. It's not that something that says, okay, I've checked all these boxes off. I'm living a good enough Christian life, and now I can go soul winning. It's not something that's earned, folk. It's, some, it's something that's granted unto you, and it's a privilege. <clears throat> Preaching the gospel, cleansing these lepers, it's a priestly privilege that is granted, not earned. And really, when we start to look at the scriptures, soul winning actually makes us better Christians. Look, if I want somebody to clean up their life and start being a better Christian, I'm going to take a soul winning. Because they're going to start to see God work in other people, and they say, I want a part of that. And they're going to want to preach the gospel, and they're going to get in their Bibles, and they're going to be in church more, and they're going to attend services. You know what? And just by nature of being, just through being there for all that, they're, they're going to start to live better Christian lives. And look, should we all strive to live better Christian lives? Of course. I mean, isn't it that this whole sermon was about this morning? And how many other sermons can we point to that I've preached, that other people pre- preached, that have said, hey, live a holy life, clean up your life, get better. You know, it's not like we're against that or something. We're for it. And I'm here to tell you that soul winning will make you actually a better Christian. It will help you clean up your life. It's not the other way around. If you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. He said in John 15, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth. Look, the guy that's going out and winning souls and preaching the gospel, God's going to work in his life and purge him. He's going to help him cut out the sin in his life. He's going to help him be a better Christian. That it may bring forth more fruit. 2 Timothy, or you're in Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse 1. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. You know, you want to clean up your life, you want to clean up your thought life, you want to clean up the way you think about things, you want to clean up your philosophy on life, you want to clean all that up, commit your works unto the Lord. Isn't that how the equation works? Isn't that how it goes there? Isn't that the order of things? Commit your works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Isn't it, hey, start doing the work, get out there, win the souls, and, and, and get committed to living, you know, going out and doing the work of God, and you know what, the living for God will come after that. The thoughts will follow. It's, that's the order of things there. Now, if you would, go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Look, we should be better Christians. We should, oh, but that's, at what point do we say, I've arrived? Never. And that's what this morning's sermon was all about. But I'm preaching this, this evening to let us know that, look, going out and preaching the gospel is something that is a privilege. And we should never get this idea of, I'm not good enough to go soul winning. I'm not good enough to go out and anoint some leper. I'm not good enough to go out and teach and preach the word of God to somebody and spread, you know, know, and and, and help impart the Holy Ghost unto them. Because that oil, my friend, was put in the left hand of that priest. And I don't think God just said, ah, just pick a hand, any hand. He said the left hand for a reason. And he put that passage in there after Leviticus chapter 8, where he clearly says that the left hand was the one that was not covered with the blood. And it's showing us that what? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. None of we, we're never perfect. We're never going to be good enough. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, still, you know, we should strive to be better Christians. The Bible says that, of course. Verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this, this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. Let them do it. You know, if you name the name of Christ, you should be getting further and further away from iniquity. You know, if you have some sin in your life and you know it, you need to get out of that sin. You need to crucify the flesh. And you can go listen to this morning's sermon. We went all through that. Verse 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So the Bible is saying here, that in this great house, there are all these different types of vessels, some that are of gold and of silver, but some of wood and of earth, some of honor and some to dishonor. But if we get those things which are dishonorable, if we purge ourselves from these, if we separate from what? Like it says in verse 19, if we depart from iniquity, 
you know, then we will be meat for the master's use. So yes, of course, there is this principle that if we want to be better used of God, we should clean up our lives. You know, just, just for anybody that's doubting, you know, that whether or not we preach that, you know, somehow soul winning is some, a, a penance for your sin. It's not. And if, you know, if maybe you're trying to go out soul winning and you're really looking for that oil in that left hand. You know, it's in there somewhere. You know, if you want to fill that thing up, you know, then go ahead and be a, a vessel unto honor. Purge yourself from iniquity. Separate from these things. Depart from it. And get more of that Holy Spirit. Okay? But I'm telling you, even if that, no matter how sinful you are, that, that oil is in there somewhere. You might have to go looking for it, but it's in there, and God can still use you. Of course, we should purge ourselves from these so that we can be a, a, a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared on every good work. But, you know, what is the iniquity that we're to depart from? Is it just sin in general? You know, what are these dishonorable vessels that we are to purge from? Well, it's in the context of the, of the scripture, of this passage. If you go back to verse 4, he's talking a lot about, you know, separating from different things, departing from iniquity, purging ourselves from these things. Look at verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen, to be, chosen him to be a soldier. You know, one of the things that can, can prevent us from being a, ma- a vessel, meet for the master's use, is getting entangled with the affairs of this life. Just not, not because we're, involved, we're sinful or we're wicked, but just because our priorities are wrong. Because we just get caught up in, a, in the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this life, and we get choked out by by the world, and we can't do the things that we ought to do. We shouldn't be entangled with these things, right? And I thought of this illustration, you know, it's like if you're, if you're, if you're on a construction site and you got to go and you got to plug in, you know, an, an, a, a, uh, an electrical tool, some kind of power tool into a wall, right? But you need an extension cord. Which, you, know, you have two extension cords on the floor. One has been, you know, put away properly, like the way I do it you know, where you make a nice loop, you know, I'll show you if you don't know how to do this. You make a nice loop and you wrap it around, you make a little little loop in it, you, you, it's, it's put away and it doesn't tangle up. Or you could be that other guy that just, you know, wraps it up real fast like that and then just throws it in the corner and then the next guy goes to use it and he has to spend five minutes pulling every knot out of it before he can even get to work, right? You all know who that guy is, right? Hope just don't be that guy, right? But if I'm that guy, if I'm that contractor, if I'm trying to get something done, which cord am I going to reach, reach for? The one that's just there, that's prepared, that's loose, that's ready to just, you know, I don't have to sit there and, and, and untangle it. Of course, that's the one I'm going to reach for. I'm not going to sit there and reach for that one that I have to, you know, unknot it from everything else, from itself. So if we want to be a, a vessel that's, you know, better used of God, of course we should separate from these things. We shouldn't be entangled with the things of the world so much. We should be able to let go of those things more and more. What are some of these other things that he says we have to separate from? Look at verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun. Well, you know, there's that idea again of, of departing from something, of purging yourself, of not being entangled. What? Shunning profane and vain babblings, for they increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past, and overthrow, overthrow the faith of some. Look at verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts. You know, that's another thing we should separate from. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know, that verse, verse 22, is one that God impressed upon me very early on in my Christian life. I said, you know what, I got to flee from people, I got to separate from people who just want to indulge all these youthful lusts. They just want to party and fornicate and do all these things. You need to flee from those type of people and, and follow what kind of people? Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing they do gender stripes. So look, we have, yeah, of course there is a lot of purging, there's a lot of separating that we need to do. There's some things we need to get away from. But it doesn't mean, what it's not saying is that you have to just be this squeaky clean, you know, sinless person before God will use you. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, look, some of the things you have to separate are being entangled with the affairs of this life, being choked with the cares and the worries and the riches of this life. 
you know, flee from the youthful lusts and, and follow righteousness. Look, there's all types of things that we have to separate from. We have to shun the profane and vain babblings. And what has that got to do with my sinful life? Nothing. Okay? And what I'm trying to get across this, this evening is that God can use you in spite of your shortcomings. You know, and I'm walking proof of that. And many other people in this room are walking proof of that. They can go out and they can preach the gospel and people will get saved. Not because of how, how perfect they are, but because they're, they're willing to go and open their mouths and speak the word of God. Look at verse 24. He says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Look, we have a job to do, folks. We have a very important job to do. Look, the soul winning, we don't go out soul winning if we can just, you know, add more numbers to the bulletin. Like, I'm, and I'm not against that. I like keeping track so we can see how, how are we doing. You know, do we need to pick it up? Do we need to do more? But we have a job to do. You know, the reason why we go out there is because, look, we want people to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. We're trying to peep, keep people from going to hell. So, you know, what do I care, you know, it, whether or not your, how sinless your life is or isn't? I mean, if you're willing to go out and preach the gospel, we could use you. If you're willing to go out there and learn how to preach the gospel, learn how to give the gospel, and get people saved, amen, I'm on board. And I'm not going to, you know, what, am I supposed to start, you know, interrogating people before I take them soul winning? You got any sin in your life? You sin this week? Well, you better get that. Are you going to get that right? And then come back next week, and then maybe we'll go. Now, I'm going to take them out there and take them soul winning and show them how to get people saved, and then, you know what? They'll want to clean up their life on their own. I won't even have to tell them to do that. They'll want to be a, you know, a vessel meet for the master's use. They'll start to purge themselves from these. They'll start to flee from these things. And look, uh, that's what I'm trying. I'm preaching a sermon. And you know what? We have a big job to do, and I can't stand it when I hear people who want to just you know, douse soul winning or, or discourage people from soul winning for any reason. You know, I'm against that. You know, we're a soul winning church here. We need more people, not less. We need more people to get fired up. I don't need to sow doubts in the minds of people about whether or not they should be out there soul winning. Well, I just don't know if I've gotten enough, rid of enough sin in my life. I don't know if I'm, if I'm good enough to go in. Let me, let me just, you know, break it to you. You're not good enough. No one is. No one is. You know, that's that picture of that left hand. You say, hey, put that oil in that left hand. And, and you know what? But you know what? He, had, he still had the right hand, didn't he? He still had that sanctified hand, that blood-washed hand that was able to do what? Make the application. The oil just sat in that hand, didn't it? It was just in that, that left hand, but it was that sanctified finger that went in there and dipped it and applied the blood. And look, I have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. We're saved. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know, that if we go out there and preach the gospel, you know, that, that right finger is just going to go, doop, and it's going to be applied. We still have that, 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 the power of God to go out and preach the gospel and see people get saved. So why would I want to discourage people from doing it? It doesn't make any sense. It's stupid to sit there and discourage people from wanting to go out and do the one thing that, you know, of all the things that, that would probably help them clean up their life the most. Soul winning. Yeah, of course, the preaching, coming to church, that's going to help. But you know what? It, I, I've been on this side of the pulpit for, for not very long, but long enough to know this, that you can preach the same thing over and over and over again, and people still won't change. They'll say, no, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I'm not going to change. And yet, you'll take people out soul winning, and their lives will transform. And look, I, I'm looking around the room, and there's just there's testimony after testimony in this room of people who wanted to be part of a church that went out soul winning, and their lives were not the, would, they were not the epitome of, of godly Christian living. You know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but that's just the facts. You know, and that's the same way with us. You know, we were out in Michigan in the church that did want to go soul winning. You know, and, and we the fire was dying out. You know, and it was. Felt like throwing in the towel in the Christian life. Then I heard about a church that went soul winning, and I went out there and got on fire for God again. 
and got the sin out of my life. And I've seen it in this church too, and I've seen it in other churches where people come out, maybe they're not the perfect Christian, but they go soul winning and they steadily and surely start to improve. Because they go out, they begin to bear fruit, and God says, you know what, I'm going to purge that branch. I'm going to purge it so it can, make, it can make even more fruit for me. You know, and that's, that's what the Bible teaches. And it just frustrates me to hear when people try to, you know, quench someone's zeal for winning souls. And I'm not, and I'm not going to just stand quietly by and let, and let people do that. You know, if I hear that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach against it. Because I'm trying to lead a charge here in Tucson to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, to knock every door and get souls saved. You know, and along the way, you know what? People will get, their lives will clean up, they'll get better, and, and, and I don't have to worry about that. I just know that, if hey, if we take people out soul winning and show them how to give the gospel and they see, I mean, what could be more inspiring than seeing somebody get saved? I mean, you know, Brother Andrew, I'm not, you know, I don't mean to embarrass you, but that's what he said that when he came back today. He got two people saved door back to back. And what did he say? I feel alive, right? And he said, I just want to keep going, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing to sit there and preach the gospel and watch somebody believe it and get saved every time. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I know people are going to get saved, but it doesn't cease to amaze me either to watch the power. It's inspiring. You know, soul winning makes people better Christians. That's my take on it. You know, and, and God can use us in spite of ourselves. God can say, you know what, just keep that, go ahead and keep the oil in that left hand. You still got that right hand. You're still a priest. You're still a believer. You know, you still have the power of God in your life to go out and cleanse the leper. We as God's children still have the power to go out as God's priests and offer spiritual sacrifices and, and help the spiritual lepers in the city of Tucson. And help them to get saved and understand and know the gospel. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.